chapter 21, verses 5 through 11. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Again, this is Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 5. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, When will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, Watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. All God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. So you only need to open up the newspaper. I guess that's an old phrase, open up the newspaper. Maybe pull it up online, right? But you only need to look at the news and see that we're all in peril, right? There's some sort of catastrophe day after day. I was reading in the New York Times, there's an article from a, written by a professor, says there is a giant volcano underneath Yellowstone National Park. And if that volcano were to erupt, it would wipe out life on Earth as we know it. All right? And you can look and you can see about things like the wars. Every time there's something going on in the Middle East, sure enough, end of the world is near. We see it all the time. And these things that we read and the things that we're told, they're coming from these modern-day prophets, and they're all claiming the end is near for us. And Jesus warns us in this passage today that there are many who will proclaim that the end is near. But these are all false proclamations pointing to events that must occur now. But they're not indicating that the end is imminent. When we hear these things, Jesus tells us not to be deceived not, and to watch out so that doesn't happen. But what we should do is understand that these events are simply indications that we live in a sinful and fallen world. And that should turn our hearts and minds to the only one who can relieve this world of all its sin and all its fallenness, the Lord Jesus Christ. So today I want to take this passage. It's a part of a larger discourse called the Olivet Discourse because Jesus tells his disciple these things on the Mount of Olives. It's found in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And let's get into it. It's a long passage. We're only going to do a part of it today and, and part of it uh, next time. So here it starts out. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. Now, as we are reading this, again, let's get to the setting. This is the Passion Week. On Sunday, Jesus came in on Palm Sunday. After that, he cleansed the temple. After that, he's been coming into the temple daily to teach and preach. He was questioned by the authorities, and he's had arguments and whatnot. But he continues to come back, and every night he goes to the Mount of Olives to sleep, and then he comes back down the next day. So here we are in the middle of the Passion Week. They're leaving the temple. And the disciples look at the temple. And if you've ever been to Israel and you've seen what remains of the Temple Mount, it is an um, immense, impressive structure. Even just the western wall that's left, that foundation part, is tremendous to look at. In its day, it was beautiful, gleaming white and gold, according to Josephus. And the disciples are walking out and they're looking at this fabulous building. And they remark to Jesus how fabulous it is. So Jesus takes this as an opportunity to teach them once again. And he says, what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. The temple will be destroyed, is what he tells them. So this, of course, in their mind, evokes a messianic concept. 
Remember, they've been believing that the Messiah will come back and he will bring the glory of ancient Israel back to four. That he will take the seat of his father David, reign as king, throw out the Romans. It's a huge revolution. And the destruction of the temple certainly would usher in that day. And so from that mindset, they ask two questions about what they perceive as one event. They say, teacher, in verse 7, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to take place? So they ask two questions. And what we're going to see today, at least in today's sermon, is Jesus doesn't immediately answer these questions. So we have to put those two questions on hold till the next time. As he very often does, Jesus doesn't immediately directly answer the question, but instead he goes on to tell them something else. And in verse 8, he tells us first a warning. Before he tells them about the end times events, he is going to give them this warning. And he says, watch out that you are not deceived. Verse 8. And I want you all to focus on that sentence for a moment. Watch out. This word in Greek is blepo. It means to look out or be on guard. It can mean to discern, be aware. Be aware of what's going on in the world. Be on guard of what's going on in the world. Watch out, as the NIV says, so that you are not deceived. It also means to be led astray or led into error. This whole discourse begins with a warning, and I believe Jesus gives the warning because he knows that they have a misunderstanding of end times events. I think we all have a misunderstanding of end times events. And so Jesus clearly says, watch out, be aware, be on guard. Don't be deceived. Don't be led astray. And that's great advice. <clears throat> Throughout history, we have heard false prophets proclaiming the end of the world. It goes all the way back even to before Jesus' day. It continues to occur today. There's sensationalism in the media. There's folks who get up and preach that the end is near. I remember those pictures of people carrying signs, you know, the end is near. And Jesus tells us of these things to watch out that you're not deceived. And if you hear nothing else in the rest of the sermon, just hold on to that part. Watch out and don't be deceived. Take these words to heart. When you hear of these things, when you watch the news or read the news, there's something tragic going on, what is the first thought you have? Is it that, oh no, this is really it? Or is it this is just one more false prophet of doom? So who are these false prophets of doom? Jesus goes on to say, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. So first of all, he says there will be many, and history has proven there have been many people coming over saying the end is near. It says they will come in my name. Some of these folks will be Christians who are preaching doom and gloom. They claim I am he is what it says in the NIV. Some of your translations might say I am the Christ or I am the Messiah. In the original Greek, it just says ego a me, which is I am. They will come claiming I am. And if you recall your Hebrew scriptures, uh, Exodus chapter 3, when Moses asked God, what is your name? What was the answer he gave? I am. Are these people who are coming are claiming that they are God, that they are either God himself or the Messiah, the Christ. So all those translations make sense, but they're claiming some divinity in their proclamation. And then he says, they all say the time is near, the end is here. And we have to look at each one of these groups, I would say, a little bit differently. The first group who comes in the name of the Lord, other Christians. Now I can tell you that end times prophecies, there are so many different interpretations of Scripture. And we're all reading from the same Scripture. Right, but there's different ways to take different things. And what I say today, you may not agree with, but that's okay. Because we're all working out of the same book and trying to understand 
the end times, which is a very difficult concept to understand, and I don't believe is fully revealed anyway. So when it comes to other Christian preachers, have grace. Have grace. They may have a different interpretation of you uh, than you. I remember um, Bob Lohman, who is the head of the Metrolina Baptist Association, told me during my ordination questioning, he said that when he was uh, up for ordination, they asked him, tell us your perspective on the end times. And he said, all I can tell you for sure is Jesus is coming back. And he didn't tell them anything else. And he said they didn't like that answer. He said they wanted him to profess a certain viewpoint on the end times, and he said he wasn't going to do that because he couldn't prove any one of them from Scripture. All right, and I think that's a good place to start when we think about other Christians. Now, the false messiahs, those who claim to be God or claim to be Christ, flatly reject those. Right? No one can claim divinity uh, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those who proclaim the end is near, well, I mean, you're just going to have to take that with a grain of salt. Because I'm going to tell you, you should just, frankly, ignore them. All right. So we have these false folks coming out, telling us these false things. What are they telling us? Verse 9, when you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. All right. What Jesus is saying when he points to these different signs, and those two verses go together, or there are man-made catastrophes, and there are what we would call natural disasters. Man-made catastrophes. He starts out with wars and revolutions. He goes on to say nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. All, right, all of these are man versus man sort of things. Then we talk about natural occurrences, earthquakes, famines, pestilence, fearful events, signs from heaven. All these things, as it says, cause concern and fear, and folks point to them, the end is near. When we think about man-made events, as I said before, anytime there's a conflict in the Middle East, you'll read in the papers, is this end times prophecy, right? China, Russia, North Korea, wherever it is, it doesn't matter. There's been war in the world all the way back to Jesus' day, and there'll be war in the world until he returns. Natural events. He mentions earthquakes. Now, I remember when I was a kid, there was this whole idea about the San Andreas Fault and that California one day would fall off into the Pacific Ocean after a great earthquake. I don't know if you ever heard that one, but crazy you know, earthquakes have happened again over and over. Famines. Back in the 70s, worldwide starvation was proclaimed, that the earth was going to uh, run out of food, there'd be too many people, and there'll be mass starvation. Half the world's population will die never happened. Pestilences, when the HIV scare first came out, that was a concern. Polio today, people not getting their immunizations, all these things will lead to some sort of pestilence. If you watch any science fiction movie about zombies, what causes the zombie apocalypse? A virus, right? It's always something out there that's going to get you. Fearful events, all right, there's daily occurrences of fearful events, from shootings to the one right now is the Amazon rainforest is burning, right? And you've probably read that the Amazon is the lungs of the earth, and 20% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the Amazon rainforest. I'm sure you've read that, or you may have. All right, don't buy that either. This is another end times doom and gloom prophecy. Signs from heaven. Right, earlier this year, remember the blood red moon that came out? Go back and Google that. You'll see. Is it the end of the world? It's the blood moon. This has been prophesied. Right? All of these things people are pointing to to try to scare you and tell you the end is near. And what we have to do is recognize these things for what they truly are. Because they're not end times prophecy. They're not indicators that the end is near. Jesus tells us very plainly here in verse 9, these things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. 
See, these things are going to come. There is a certain sequence of events that will continue to build, but all of these man-made and natural disasters have been going on from the fall, honestly, all the way up until today, and they will continue to happen until Jesus returns. These events, both man-made and natural, are simply indicators that we live in a sinful and fallen world. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned against God, all of creation has gone into sin. And all of mankind has inherited the sin of Adam. And that's the world we live in. And consequently, there's wars and revolutions and earthquakes and famines and pestilence and all the rest. But it's not an indication that the end is imminent. Yes, the end is coming, but these things are going to continue to go on. When you read it in the original Greek, Verse 11, it says, there will be great, it says, and also there will be great earthquakes, and also famines, and also pestilence, and also fearful events, and also signs from heaven. Luke is very clear, and it's again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and that's just the way we hear these things. All right, so what we need to take from this is to remember, these events are not the end of the world. Right. When you hear about this stuff, please don't get frightened. As Jesus says, watch out and don't be deceived. Don't follow after these people. Don't listen to what they say. There is something that it should make you think about. When you read of wars and revolutions and famines and earthquakes and all the rest of the things, and it reminds you that we live in a sinful, fallen world, I want that to point your heart and mind and soul to one person the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the world will come to an end at some point, and the world will be renewed. And it will again one day be sinless, and so will we. But only in the new heavens and a new earth. And the only one who can bring that about, the only one who has already overcome sin and death, and we await that time for us, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So in all things... Don't be deceived. Don't let this point you to the sin of the devil, but let this all point you to the grace of God. And you'll be much more joyful and wonderful Christian believers. And all God's people said, Amen. Next week we'll get to the answers to the question, so you'll have to wait or in two weeks, but you will uh, have to wait on that. We'll get to the rest of that passage. It's a good passage. But at this time, as I've got your mind now fixed, hopefully, back onto the Lord Jesus Christ and off of all those things that are going on out there, and as I reminded you that there is only one who can overcome sin in your life, frankly, he's already done it. You just need to take it and accept it. This is why we come to this point in time in the service. This is what we call the invitation or many people call the altar call. It's that opportunity for those out there who have been living lives of fear or have been living lives of works righteousness or have been living lives without Christ in some way to say, you know what, David, I want that joy of knowing I'm saved. I want that peace and understanding that the Lord is sovereign over all things, including my life, if I just turn it over to him. And so we give you that opportunity each and every Sunday. In a moment, Terry's going to come up and lead us in the invitational hymn. And if the Lord moves you to come forward and say, I want to give my life to Christ today, then please come down and meet me here at the cross. Now, we always open up the table here for anyone who would like to come down and ask for prayer, give me praise for something that's going on in your life, whatever it might be. Always available to hear those prayers and praises. And then finally, we always offer the opportunity for people to come forward if they want to join the church and become members of the church. But first and foremost, the altar call is for those who want to give their life to Christ today. And so please be in prayer that someone will do that. If not, not here, some point during this week. Terry, can you please come forward?
There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace, when He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when by Jesus I shall see and I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace. When He rakes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Amen. We Amen. look forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the meantime, in these end times, in the sinful days, remember, watch out. Don't be deceived. Do not be fearful. Do not be disheartened. But look to the one who will make all things new. Jesus, we pray. Amen.